And you mentioned your book, Pairing with Exercise. There are some foods that you suggest that you pair with exercise. Talk about that a little bit, what exercise does to help you manage your glucose mm. spiking. Yeah. I thought that was fascinating. If you just take a very short walk or do a little bit of physical activity right after a meal, it significantly decreases your glucose elevation, your blood sugar elevation from that meal. And it can be for as little as like five minutes. The key is that when you move your body right after a meal, so this could look like walking around the block with your family, you are activating tons of muscle groups, huge muscle groups, your legs and your abs. When you're walking, you're using a lot mm -hmm. of muscles. And what that's actually gonna do is it's gonna help drive the, the glucose channels, these GLUT4 channels from inside the cell mm -hmm. to the cell membrane. So insulin can do that. The hormone insulin can also stimulate those channels to come to the cell membrane, but so does muscle contraction. So basically, by just moving your body a little bit after a meal, it's sending your body like this incredible biochemical signal to put those channels on the membrane and help take the glucose out of the bloodstream to be processed by the mitochondria. So when we have that lower glucose spike over a meal, it also has the other benefit of preventing, ideally, that the trough. crash. <laughs> and so you're just stabilizing things a little bit. And I think especially after dinner, because in the evening, actually, this is little known, but like we become more insulin resistant at night. Um, that just because of the way that melatonin, which is released before we go to bed, it impacts our insulin sensitivity. And so especially after dinner, taking like a 10 minute walk can really help stabilize our blood sugar before bedtime. And for those of us that have any trouble sleeping, glucose bouncing around at night can actually inhibit sleep quality. So the more we can stabilize it with like a blood sugar balancing meal at night, which means a meal that's not ultra processed and that ideally has protein, healthy fat and fiber, mm -hmm. and then take a little walk after the meal and then have a few hours before bed, that would really be ideal for, from a sleep perspective because you're keeping your blood sugar a bit more stable. And no food for how many hours before you go to bed? I think that ideally, four. I would say three to four. Three to yeah, just for sleep quality, yeah. you know? And also it gives you that more time while you're sleeping to process through that glucose. And then ideally, hopefully, you're not eating long enough overnight that you switch actually into some fat burning. Like glucagon. Exactly. Yeah. And start using up your stored glucose that's in the liver and the muscles, and then that's eventually okay. turn on that fat burning. The average American is almost never burning fat because we eat so frequently. I think the average American now has 11 eating events per day. Mm -hmm. So because we're putting all that glucose into the body, the body They never stimulate they glucagon. They never stimulate glucagon. Mm -hmm. We never stimulate fat oxidation. So we become metabolically inflexible because it's kind of use or lose it with a lot right. of our cell yeah. signaling. If you're never doing fat oxidation, you become rusty at it, which is why we see people having they like drop. anger. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, they drop their glucose. Yeah. Whereas people that are doing intermittent fasting, yep. they get used to being low and they learn to upregulate their glucagon. Yes. Yeah. And then they start burning fat and, and their body's like, has the energy it needs. Well, so you don't more, go into panic it's mode. It's more flexible of a yeah. body metabolically yes. to be able to move from glucagon to insulin and back and forth. Exactly. What does your levels data show mm -hmm. about glucose spiking with alcohol? Oh my gosh. Because it's come to my attention that really the caloric content of alcohol per gram is greater than a carb, but mm. not as great as a fat. Mm -hmm. So it's a supercharged carb. Yeah. So for everything we do, one, it's a caloric beast. You know, people are consuming 400 calories a day from alcohol, Jeez. which is, no, two glasses of wine, two drinks a day. That's what men are allowed to drink in America today. So what does that do to our levels? Oh my gosh. Specifically when it comes to blood sugar, we found something very interesting in our data set, which is that actually straight spirits, so like a shot or wine, they actually sometimes cause people to lower their glucose, which is unfortunate because it actually makes people think that it's okay when in fact it's damaging the body. The way that it's actually lowering glucose is not good. The body has three ways of keeping the blood sugar stable. We can eat blood sugar, we can break down stored blood mm -hmm. sugar like through glycogen, we break down chains of glucose, or our liver can make glucose through right. glucose neogenesis. 
process. And when alcohol is processed, it blocks, it uses some of the same machinery that does gluconeogenesis. So basically one of the three faucets of glucose Turned gets up. blocked. Mm -hmm. So it looks like our glucose is lower, but really it's because you're impairing a really necessary process in the liver. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like a good lowered glucose. And so that's one thing we see is that actually people sometimes find that they'll eat pasta and intentionally have like a drink because it'll keep their glucose lower, which is not the outcome. That's not the way we want people to be using glucose. So, so we have to do a lot of education. It's a lot more complicated than your levels show. It's more complicated. And that's probably why fatty liver yeah. plus alcohol is now so the bad. number one cause for liver failure in women. Did yeah. you know that? I, d I did the know that, The number one yeah. reason for liver failure for transplant listing now in Texas for women is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, yeah. but certainly alcohol on top of that um, makes it much con much worse. Yeah, I think we're totally addicted to alcohol in our country in yeah, a way that people aren't talking about. I think that's why I brought it up. It's really important I because when drink, I yeah. when I bring it up to patients, they look at me like I have twelve heads. It's because like, it, it's an you, addiction. You want to take away my alcohol now? Yeah. Like you want me to exercise? You want me to eat nine servings of fruits and vegetables? <laughs> It's problematic, and, then, and it needs to be discussed because I'm I'm worried about the effect on um, the brain health. It's huge, especially for women. And I think if you think about seven drinks a week for women and 14 for men, mm -hmm. which I believe is still the current it is. recommendation. But what's interesting is that some of that metabolic research, you know, in the past has shown that there's this J-shaped curve with alcohol, which is like basically saying that at zero drinks, we actually have higher higher than one drink, which got, gave everyone this free pass of like, oh, I can drink it's alcohol. It's good for you. It's good for it's you. It's heart healthy. That's very hard to peel back. What we've, at, what we've learned more recently is that any level of alcohol mm -hmm. above zero is neurotoxic. Like it yeah. is actually. It's, it's, it actually increases the risk for atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation and, Huge. oh my gosh, isn't it one of the key factors it's for atrial fibrillation? Yeah, and then also for Alzheimer's dementia that mm -hmm. is now starting to like creep younger and younger. And so we have this already dysfunctional cell because of our ultra processed food and the environmental toxins and all the things we've talked about. And then I think alcohol is kind of just like mm -hmm. pouring fuel on the fire. I also think if you really look at the alcohol quantities of what's a standard drink, it's like a five ounce glass of wine. I've been to restaurants where it's definitely a 10 ounce it's glass cool. of wine, you know, and so five ounces of wine is, is not very much. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're also probably underestimating the amount we, we definitely. are drinking. I definitely so, think it's yeah. true. I'm actually quite worried about it. I do think that the younger generations are drinking less. It's interesting. Yeah, they're definitely drinking less. Yeah. And it's been shown. So that's, that's optimistic. Mm -hmm. That's good news. What do you think it is with the alcohol? I think it's just socially less um, acceptable to be drunk. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Which is huge. So I'm glad for that. <laughs> it also, if you think about, like, we have to do the exercise and we have to cook and we have to do all these things, like, alcohol, it dulls your motivation. Clearly. And so I think what a lot of people don't understand is that that desire for alcohol, that is a sign of dependency. Of all the addictions yeah. to get over, it may be one of the easier ones. Yeah. But to stay off alcohol is more difficult because it's socially right. part of the fabric yeah. of yeah. what we do for fun. Totally. And so if that's slowly changing, then that's, that's beneficial to our that's society. That's good, yeah. yeah that's kind of good. That yeah. is good. Oh. Well, Casey, thanks so much for coming oh to gosh. join us here. And you're here for your book tour, right? Yes. That's cool. When does the book come out? May 14th. Oh, it's soon? Yeah, very soon. Cool. So excited to just keep doing what you guys are doing, which is spreading the good word of you know, how to be metabolically healthy. It's the most important thing I if think it's we hard, can be focused on. I will tell you, it's hard to get people motivated and the medical financial system doesn't encourage us to spend time talking about these mm. things with patients. Yeah. Then they're, you know, they're, they're just a little bit bored of hearing the topic. You know, they know what, if you go and ask people, they know. The question is, what do they know and why don't they do something about it? Right. Thank you for coming to town, Dr. Means. This has been so enlightening, and all our viewers are going to really appreciate the pearls of wisdom that you provided for us today. So we hope to have you back sometime. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Yeah, my Thank pleasure. You. It was really nice to meet you. You too. Thank you. Thank you.